Warning! Tube amplifiers have lethal voltages inside them. Please do not attempt to build, test, or repair these without understanding and following all safety protocols. Hey y'all! Well, we're back for the next segment of our A12. And I want to post these videos as I'm going through this process. I'm not done. If you want to jump ahead and follow along with what I'm doing, you may end up taking the amp apart two or three times. You may end up buying tubes that we're not going to end up using. I'm warning you now that things can change as we're going along because there is no cookie cutter path that I can follow on this where I can go, oh yeah, 100 people have fixed this amp doing it this way. Everybody knows this works. This is how you do it. That's not the case with this. I'm looking at, you know, some forum posts where people are talking about doing crazy things like cutting the grid leak resistor in half and then doubling the coupling capacitor. Guys, that makes like no sense whatsoever. Another post I saw, and that this guy was talking about the on the output tube. Another person was talking about how changing the value of the grid leak resistor on the driver made some huge difference. Guys, it can't. Because this is an integrated amp with a volume control, you don't even need a grid leak resistor on the driver. The only reason it's there is in case the volume control fails, the tube doesn't run away. Lowering the value of that it's already low. This is a 100k volume pot. The highest resistance this can have is 100k. And when you turn the volume up, it heads toward zero. So I think there's a ton of misinformation out there about this amp and modifying it. It's so far out of tune that doing things like changing the coupling caps just I hate to say it, guys, I think a lot of it's just a placebo. People are, you know, putting parts in and doing things, and they're hearing stuff that isn't there. And I know that's going to piss some people off, but I just, when, when I see an amp that has 6% distortion when it's at 1%, and the frequency response is as bad as it is on this amp, things like changing a coupling cap to some fancy one that's a fine tuning thing that's like what you do to something that sounds really good and really measures well then you start tuning stuff like that so anyway without getting in too deep into that mess i think we're on the right path i know i talked about doing the 7591 tubes well viewer pointed out and i had overlooked that those tubes don't have the same pinout, so it's not a drop-in thing like the 6V6 was. There's potentially some other tubes out there. Maybe some 6L6s could plug in and do head in the direction that the 6V6s were that maybe will play better with these 3.2K output transformers. But I decided that if I'm going to go inside this amp and you're going to have to get out the soldering iron, I'm going to try to make it work with the parts that it comes with. And so we're going to be using these PS Fade EL34s. We're going to use these PS Fade 12AX7s. We ditched the China rectifier, and this is a Gold Lion 5AR4. Do not recommend using a JJ. There's some JJ tubes I like, not the rectifier tubes. I've had one, actually I had two of them short out for no reason and otherwise perfectly fine amplifier they blew up so maybe they work at really low voltage guitar amps like 200 volts and stuff but they will not work in an amp when the voltage gets over 300 so don't make that mistake stayed up late last night came up with some incredible distortion numbers out of this thing 
these output transformers are going to work, guys. I don't think there's any reason to replace them. I mean, obviously, there's some higher-end ones that could potentially sound better, but when you're talking about a $500 amp, does it really make sense to put $500 worth of output transformers in it? I, I don't think so. So my goal is to try to make all this iron work, all these tubes work, and it looks like a handful of resistors and adding one capacitor is going to transform this amp. So let's jump to the scope testing and see what this thing's going to do. Okay, the first test we want to do is put this on our analog scope with the analog Tenma audio generator, which I've covered my equipment in the past. This is a 2235 megahertz oscilloscope that I've had for eons. But anyway, it's going to give us a good idea of the input sensitivity and you know, if this thing's going to make full power off of you know your standard input source from like a CD deck or a DAC. So we have on this side, we've got three volts peak to peak, which is really close to what you're going to see out of a line source like a CD deck or a DAC. And so got the amp warmed up. We got it hooked up to 8 ohm loads on the 8 ohm taps. And let's turn the volume up and see what we get. And that is one nice looking waveform. Let's pull this up. I want to adjust the volume so it's very similar to, you know, the scope pattern that we're getting out of the input. And guys, those are like all but identical. When you put those on top of each other, they disappear. And that's what you want to see. So let's see what kind of power this thing will put out now before it starts clipping and how it starts clipping. And as you can see, the waveform still isn't getting distorted. And there's some clipping right there. You can see it right on the bottom. But it's your normal looking clipping. It's just, it's getting flat. And you can see it's starting to clip on the top right afterwards. So that's like, that's what you want to see is symmetrical clipping. They're usually not perfect, but you don't want to see one clip way before the other one does. And we're not seeing that. So if we get to where it's just not clipping, which looks like about right there. Let's pull this down right on that line. And then we'll pull this over and there's 18 volts peak to peak, which is 5 watts before we see clipping. Which is really what you should expect out of a EL34 amp, single-ended. That looks absolutely perfect. And I'm super excited to see that. And that's about 5 eighths on the volume knob. So we've got really good input sensitivity. So if you wanted to drive this thing off of a cell phone or maybe a older tuner that maybe doesn't have the drive that a modern source does, you're not going to have any problem with it driving this amp. So just to reflect, let's switch over to the unmodified channel and take a look at it. And this is what I was cringing when I looked at the first time. And then we'll do a quick look at the square waves. Anybody see what's wrong with that picture? Let's, let's pull these on top of each other. And we'll increase the volume till... Wow, what a mess. I don't think anybody has to be schooled that those two waveforms don't look anything alike. And that's all the distortion we're seeing. So let's pull this up out of the way. And I mean, I don't even know where you where you call like clipping is that. I mean, that looks like it's clipping right there to me. And 
we're getting five less volts peak to peak out of the amp on the other channel which I'll put in the bubble over my head here on how many watts RMS that is but as you've seen with our previous test this is so distorted that I don't even really count that as peak power and I'm obviously very happy that we're able to get clean power out of this thing not having to change the output transformers and I'm sure you guys are all happy to see that too and like we saw last time we got ringing on this side and rounded off on that side I don't know what's going on that's a hot mess so let's see what the modified channel square wave looks like and here's our modified channel and it's got a tiny bit of ringing here but I'm not seeing a ton of overshoot and I've learned that this little bit of ringing makes the amp sound just lively and if we start doing things to the feedback circuit to get rid of this little bit of ringing the amp is just gonna sound dead but if you notice on this square wave got ringing up here got the same thing going on here we don't have that weird asymmetrical thing where it's doing a huge overshoot on this side and then round it off on that side so pass the analog scope test with flying colors and let's hook this thing up to the analog discovery 2 and see what kind of THD versus power we get out of this modified channel okay right now we have one side of the amp that's just as it comes out of the box and the other side has got my modifications up to this point so let's first do a THD versus power on the side that's unmodified and like we've seen over and over 0.05 watts it goes past 1 percent 1 watt it's at 6 percent and the software shuts itself off as it goes past 10 percent at not quite 3 watts so here is the modified channel and it starts out in about the same spot but look how low the distortion is and at the very end you see it climb up at 1 watt we've got 0.4 percent distortion 2 watts we're still under 1 percent 3 watts we're at 1.2 percent 4 watts we're still under 2 percent 5 watts it starts climbing up it's just a little over 2 percent 6 watts which is what this thing is advertised to put out it's got 3.3 percent distortion which honestly is listenable to and then obviously when it goes past there it's it's actually making seven watts now but it's at you know six and a half percent distortion it was making that much distortion at one percent on the other channel that's how much difference this has made so let's go look at the frequency response and we're going to switch back to the other channel and just like before it levels out here at about 100 Hertz and when we get down here's 40 Hertz you can see it's already dropping off and I mean it's not strong in this area right here and then it starts rolling off on the top end at about 5k so let's flip over to the other channel and you can already see how much stronger the low end is I mean even by like 40 Hertz it's I mean it's it's losing a little bit here 
but it's not a whole lot. It doesn't really start rolling off until you get down to 20 hertz. So for normal kind of bookshelf speaker use, most of them start at about 40 hertz. It's really looking pretty flat, guys. And then, again, it doesn't start rolling off on the top end until it hits 10K. And from 10 to 20K, I'm just, that's an area that I'm not that concerned with because there's just really not a lot of music there. So, again, I need to wire up the other channel so I can go listen to this thing. But looking at these curves, I think we found the low end that this amp's missing. So this is showing us what we need to see. The last test we can do is the THD versus frequency. And we're going to do it at 0.8 watts and 8 ohms. And this test takes a little while, so I'm probably going to be skipping ahead. But as you can see, on the other channel, when we pulled it, it was starting off the graph at 10%. And we're way lower than that. So as you can see, this is a humongous difference between the way this thing comes out of the box and rewired like it is. At 20 hertz, we got 3% distortion. And this does kind of look like a kind of meh output transformer. Because you can see there's... You know, the distortion really doesn't level out until it gets to, you know, 400 hertz. And then it flattens out for a little bit. And then it comes back up. But even here, it's only a half a percent distortion. And from, you know, 100 hertz to 10K, we're looking at a half a percent distortion. And... It's just here on the lower end that we're really seeing, you know, a little more distortion. But again, if you're only going down to 40 hertz, there's one and a half percent. I mean, th this is an amazing transformation of this amplifier. So I am going to go ahead and pull on the other side. Well, as you can see here, when it's at its best, it's still higher than the other channel was starting out. Down here at 20 hertz. And again, we got 10% distortion at 20 hertz at 0.8 watts of output. And it never dips below 4% until you get way up here over 5K. Because this is just a huge difference. I'm I'm really pleased where we're at with this amp. So I'm going to end this segment and wrap up this video. Well, I think we can all agree that's a pretty impressive performance and a huge change in this amplifier without doing any kind of boutique parts, without changing the tubes, without rolling in some $100, $200 new old stock tube, you know, EL34s or any of that stuff. I mean, I'll be shocked if the parts cost more than $25 to fix this amplifier. And it's just going to take some of your time. Not saying that this is the end of the road. There's some other things that I want to try with this amp. Probably going to want to play around with coupling caps. Might even try paralleling the 12AX7 and see if it does change anything. But for now... I'm super happy with the simplicity of a single triode driving the pentode and not overcomplicating things. I, I know some people feel like, oh, well, if you've got an unused triode section, you should be using it for something. And sometimes, guys, it's okay to just let it go and just leave the thing disconnected. I, I don't think, I mean, I really believe that the reason that they used two 12AX7s was that it makes the amp look symmetrical, and it's a marketing thing. I think this amp would run fine on a single 12AX7. If somebody was wanting to, like, copy this and build, 
you know, do a DIY this amp, you could totally do it with a single 12AX7. Obviously, with only one channel modified and the other one something else, it's not an ideal way to listen to something. And so I want to go ahead, modify the other channel. I want to do that on a video so I can show you guys how to take all this stuff out. It's not complicated. It actually makes it a lot easier just to go ahead and pull all the wires out of the driver tube and you know go through this is the same process I do on a DIY amp of setting up the output tube first then figuring out how to set up the driver tube to get the voltage swing we need and then wiring it up that's pretty much what I did here I'm just really happy that these output transformers are gonna be okay so next step is we're going to modify the other channel. I'm going to do that together. And I'm going to video step by step how to do this modification to this amplifier. And then I'm going to go listen to it. So don't rush out and like dive into this thing yet because I'm not giving it the skunky seal of approval yet until I get a good sounding amp. We're probably going to be playing around with the shade feedback resistor value. It has a lot of impact on how the amplifier sounds and the frequency response and just the tonal everything with it. If too high a value kind of leans towards making the high end, too low a value will make it sound muddy and it loses its like sparkle. And so it's a happy medium there where we may end up that sounds good may end up with a little more distortion than what we're seeing right now. But it's going to be nothing like it was out of the box. I mean, we might end up seeing like 1.5% distortion at a watt instead of this half percent we have now. But we're going to go with what sounds good. And I know some other people are like, you know, screw the scope. Go, you know, if it sounds good, it sounds good. I'm partially at that school of thought, but when you have a scope pattern that looks so unlike what the input signal is, for the majority of music that I listen to, it's not going to sound good. And we'll go into that in the next episode when I go over the schematic. That may be part of the build. I may do a separate deep dive into the schematic thing and kind of show you what my thought process was on modifying this. So, again, please wait, guys. I know y'all, some of y'all want to like, where's the bomb? I want to see the schematic. It's like, we're not there yet. But here is a glimpse of the schematic that I came up with. And then here's the original one. And then here's the changes to the power supply with the changes highlighted. And that's all I'm going to show you right now because I want to make sure this sounds good. But after looking at the frequency response and seeing the extension on both ends, I think this thing's going to sound fantastic. So hopefully you're enjoying my channel. If you're enjoying this series, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and we'll see you soon for more A12 fun. Have a great day.